I would like to introduce Daniel Tobin. When I was asking Daniel, why start writing poetry? What got you started? He responded, writing poetry was unprecedented in my family and I woke up one day out of the blue and decided I wanted to be a poet, a strange notion. In his earlier years, uh, Daniel said that he was influenced by the poetry of John Donne, Gerard Manley Hopkins, Elizabeth Bishop, Seamus Heaney, and also by his travels to Ireland and Italy. And in between the inspiration of poets and being in beautiful places, something clicked. Daniel now is the author of six books of poetry, including Belated Heavens, which was the winner of the Massachusetts Book Award in Poetry and The Net, which is forthcoming 2014. Along with Critical Studies, Awake in America and Passage to the Center, and he is editor of the Book of Irish American Poetry from the 18th century to the present, and he's a recipient of a number of awards for his work. Among them, the Discovery the Nation Award, the Robert Penn Warren Award, the Robert Frost Fellowship, the Ka Catherine Bakeless Nason Prize, and he has received creative writing fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts and the John Simon Guggenheim F Foundation. And when I asked Daniel, why share poetry out with others? He responded, for the same reason one is compelled to share in any art a mixture of compulsion, clarification, and hopefully delight. And with that, I would like to welcome up Daniel Tobin to share some poetry with us this morning. Please help give him a warm welcome. The air mattress inflates out of nothing, so nothing fills this sealed plastic sheet elapsed on ground while its little engine hums in motion, all space expanding with the driven sound. And underground, the turtle of creation swims through time, while on its back, the world's buoyant freight bobbles in tow below the firmament. Or it's the god sleeping, his oblivious cargo, a lotus risen from his bright navel, the universe nothing more than his dream. Before the dream ends, infinity wings by. The god wakes, stretches, then dreams the next, that floats like this raft with its two dreamers under night's tent. O oh, pale belated heavens, and a low wind breathes. I drove on the turnpike to get here from Boston. And uh, I want to read this poem. It seemed uh, suitable since I drove on the turnpike. I'd write a poem, i read a poem called The Turnpike. Uh, this will be coming out in the net. It has an epigraph from John Donne. Cheryl mentioned John Donne, and he was an early wonderful influence. And that epigraph is, an expansion like gold to airy thinness beat. You away and me on the Peter Pan, heading home for my own required remove. I'm drawn by the window's broad reflection, the traffic passing along it like a nerve. An endless charge of cars inside the pane, the voltage of the real, though as they go sliding down its long ethereal sheen, where the solid world softens into flow, they take on the ghostly substance of a dream, or rather, what we picture dreams to be, since when we're in them, they are what we seem, and cause us joy or pain as vividly as the lives we think we live between the lines that imprint us and we pass between. Here, the world inverts. Shades materialize in cars speeding left expand a breach that transports into doubles on the right. And those in transit opposite condense their mirror selves in a second teeming flight, as if our light ship bus could break such bonds and matter shatter. Like all things physical, it's a conjure of parts and energies, a neverland of haunts inside the skull. Though saying so won't prevent this child's cries from jolting with their needful disturbance, or the aging woman across the aisle from leaning in her slackened, palpable face, comically, mildly, till the infant calms. If, as scientists say, we are like hurled stones, as bounded and bound deer by material, 
and that our minds resolve into a mist we thinly feel to be the actual. Then who's to say the rock is not the air it hurtles through, observed from deeper in, not above? So you and I circuit there, firing the inexhaustible engine. It's spring, so I think it's suitable for a, uh, a yard poem. A couple of yard poems, actually. This first one is called No Boundary. And it also has an epigraph from William Blake. And that is, and every space that a man views around his dwelling place, standing on his own roof, or in his garden, or a mount of 25 cubits in height. Such space is his universe. No boundary. Boundless, though finite, the universe lives in increments of imagination, galaxies pulsing with lust to be human, as if the music of the spheres chimed to Bach and breakage, and shattered glass were prelude to a Mozart concerto. I put down the book, leave my study with its volumes stacked like extinctions on the shelves. Bright April day, the sun unobscured by cloud. Barefoot, pants rolled above my knees, I see the gardens newly tilled, its hegemony of vegetables, flowers, herbs, unrisen into their predestined places. And beyond, the house with its levels of brick and untarnished trim, its windows burnished clarity ripe for a spread in better homes or life, my solid world. But how hard to think of entropy, planets hurled into space that is its own yo-yo whirling them back again, or a family on vacation arriving home before they left, their deaths greeting them at the door. The mind breaks like a child's favorite toy, a woman collapses on her husband's coffin, her face smiling with grief, while memory's black hole cradles him in her arms. Still, I could dwell here, physicist of the familiar, till the moon that magicians coin slipped behind a neighbor's house, till stars woke in the skull's planetarium, a first man, imperial homo sapiens, and that wouldn't be enough. I could feel, lying in grass, that there are no boundaries, my body a sun burning on its own horizon. Though imagination's never brave enough to open all the rooms of its mansion, its gardens where time, for an instant, inhabits itself. Where the least force, gravity, proves the greatest, the longing persists as if to be and to love were one conjugation, or as if this ant that crawls on my ankle, inspecting my birthmark, pose no threat, thinking me the earth. It's Holy Saturday, and so it's probably apt to read a poem called Lawn Thatching on Holy Saturday. So here it is. Already tomorrow's backache runs its insistent tendrils along my spine, though nothing to lay me low, a good stiffness through which the body wakens to its own fallible presence. Like some antediluvian hand, my rake's splayed tines claw the ground, garnering chaff, last summer's luxuriance swooned to a gray waste, my lawn nearly bleached of green. Here and there, these several blades keep their stubborn faith in earth, flush as Whitman's disposition, while the thatch bag blooms heavier with its nearly weightless charge, ragged as the dead poet's beard. Too easy to say nature's enough, like my friend last night over pints. When you're dead, you're dead, that's it. His withered eye glazed to marble where the nerve died, his legs a topography of clots and sores. Too hard to appease the wish for more, this page the wind must have swept from some child's pack. Trace the words and color the picture, 
braced against my yard's border of evergreen, a lost design, a blanched wing flapping. Really, a flat Easter egg with clouds unshaded, a pair of eyeless doves flying over. Are they rainbows, shell-colored still? Down the center, a cross with curved, uplifted arms. It's dotted, he is risen, left undrawn. Tomorrow, I'll turn to the garden. Last year's ferns, a tussle of lace, blanketing the bronze knobs of fiddleheads waiting to unfurl. Clip the walk's spray of lavender. Shear the hollowed shafts of bergamo. I'll twist the sedum stalks that cut, clear under the bayberry bush, with its berries like shining blood drops, its thorns pricking even through gloves, then a faint shadow under the skin, that subtle burning to be released. After all that gardening, we have to go to an urban poem, a sort of urban poem. This is called Gutter Life. Shook, 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 like the past tense of a breeze under the eaves scrim. Occasionally, a beak's melodic instrument lifted up, school bus yellow, its skittish alto threading from the impossible throat, then a sudden tussle of wings before the errant parent arrows off only to return. How many times, while we watched just the two of us, you with your warm intent, me chattering on in the skull's unkempt haven. The body's prime cause is the soul. Again, again, while the first ticks nick an inside shell, the flown song attending each nearly weightless, clamorous heart. One song to another. <clears throat> Unchained melody. One page of the newspaper splays like wings of a seagull against the storm fence raised around the retreat that was a college in the last century before the church renovated it and built the old folks home in the same faux gothic with new cream brick. I pick up such things local history just by living long enough in one place and never need to visit the town archives or the bookstore on Main, which I do, to riffle through the new and gently used and banter with the owner when I buy. Or today, pass through empty-handed into the street, the names of buildings still readable on the few preserved facades, and the memory of the first occupants more effaced than some peeling billboard uncovered like one of Pompey's frescoes I might read about in a newspaper. This one, trapped against the chain link, a feature in the metro section beside gazebo nearly ready for the fourth. Though it could be headlines, election news, a house burned in someone else's tragedy, cars and bikes for sale, furniture and estates, prom night previews, obits, the sports page with its important forgettable scores. I transpose it into a blazing tree, transfigure it to be a golden bird or fire-fangled peacock, this urgent scrap, scavenger flapping madly to ascend when I happen by, lusty for symbols, then turn the corner only to hear music pouring, no lie, from my own house, my wife singing madrigals, adieu, sweet amaryllis, and can almost feel myself bleeding, almost feel myself beginning to bleed like so much ink into the earth, bleed here and now into nothing and fly. Um, I'm going to read a poem which is a very formal poem and it's called A Paradell. 
was invented by Billy Collins. And Billy Collins invented that particular form as a joke. Uh, and it goes like this. There are four stanzas, six lines in each stanza. The first two lines of the first stanza repeat. The second two lines repeat. And then the final two lines repeat, uh, don't repeat, but use all of the words in the first four lines and no other words. <laughs> you do that two other times, so first, second, third stanza, and then in the final fourth stanza, you have to use only the words you've used throughout the poem and no other words to make up <laughs> the fourth stanza. And it, he did it as a kind of joke with these highly repetitive forms. So uh, you get all of the articles at the end, uh, uh, the, the, uh, 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 like that. But I wanted to do one where, you actually ma where it actually made sense. <laughs> so I, 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 I gave it a shot. This is called Prayer. There is something to be praised in repetition. There is something to be praised in repetition. For surely all life moves in seasons. For surely all life moves in seasons. Praise surely for all there is, seasons, life, moves in repetition to be something. Still desire for rest whispers in the body. Still desire for rest whispers in the body like the hint of a lost name or a nagging song, like the hint of a lost name or a nagging song. Rest desires a name for the song, a hint, nagging, lost, like a still body in whispers. Let me wait a novice on nothing's threshold. Let me wait a novice on nothing's threshold until the blown seed lifts on its diamond fulcrum, until the blown seed lifts on its diamond fulcrum. Novice, blown fulcrum, let me lift on nothing until its threshold awaits the diamond seed. Something waits for the body in whispers, diamond hint in seasons of repetition, or surely it lifts on a still fulcrum. Let me rest, its novice, like all nagging life, until desire moves, blown seed, nothing's name. There it is, threshold, Lost song to be praised. I'm going to read a poem called Late Bloomer. And this is another highly formal poem. This is called a Huzzle. I'll do the Huzzle. And it's, it's, a, it's uh, an Arabic form. And so it operates more or less in this way. They're all um, um, couplets. And the last three uh, syllables have to rhyme uh, in the second uh, couplet, uh, in the second line of every couplet. And you, you do this as long as you want to, basically, because there's no, there's no narrative running through it. It's not meant to be narratively driven. And then the, the end, if it's a true huzzle, uh, all of the, every syllable in every line has to be 11 syllables and no more, no less. And then uh, the last line, you have to sign your own name into the final line in some way. So I take on a persona. So this is a persona huzzle. Late bloomer. And this is the last poem I'll read. Something whispered I wanted more of myself. That's how I turned into the fleur of myself. The lake, the ripples shimmer, that lilting face. I'll guzzle the infinite pour of myself. What is this flow I feel, its course through soft bone, the current, the mother load, the oar of myself? Fill me with all things, empty me completely. I winnow and still am the store of myself. Imagine Earth, the stars, all space expanding, and finding everywhere the core of myself. If soul's estate means a mansion's many rooms, then someday I will take a tour of myself. Do you think me insane, my hypocrite twin, a catatonic stare, the whore of myself? Call me this, call me that, call me what you will. I surpass beyond words the lore of myself. Time blooms with space, and there sums all I am. I am forever the before of myself. Beauty is truth, truth beauty, beauty is truth. X to nth power is the shore of myself. Narcissus, 
the name a wind passing through wind. Now watch me step through the door of myself. Thank you. You read two poems. <clears throat> First one is called Bourgeois, and it's response to a um, to something written by Gustave Flaubert, the uh, uh, the novelist, and it's the epigraph of the poem. In order to write like a revolutionary, you need to live like a bourgeois. I do pretty well at the bourgeois part flossing my teeth daily, going to sleep at a reasonable hour, eating my vegetables. But so far, it's not bearing fruit. None of my poems is riddled with bullet holes. None has burst into flames when I read it, leaving behind an acrid cloud of smoke. No one will accuse me of going too far, of stepping over a line, of trying to reinvent the form. Despite my playing tennis without a net, Robert Frost would be comfortable with my words and images, while language poets would turn up their noses at my comprehensibility. I won't be lobbing my poems through suburban picture windows or launching them like mortar shells over the walls of academia. I won't tape poems to my chest and run amok in the supermarket. I will continue to write what I know, the zen of housework, ping pong with my son, gazing at stars while walking home through the local cemetery. And if I'm fortunate, a poem will occasionally slip into an unsuspecting reader's heart, set off a tiny explosion. And this is a poem about a poet who's truly a revolutionary because of his uh, because of his circumstances. It's called Hazardous Materials, and the the um, epigraph here. This is a poet I met at an international poetry festival in Ireland who came from Iran, and he had a chapbook there. And one of the things that talking about his biography uh, on the chapbook said, Adnan Al Sayeg upset the militia and after reading was threatened with having his tongue cut out and with death. Each time I mail a sheaf of poems, the clerk asks, is there anything dangerous or hazardous in there? <laughs> I'm tempted to joke, not unless you consider poetry dangerous. But then I think of Adnan in Basra his poems exploding like car bombs in the minds of his conservative countrymen, his flight to London, his exile in a world of poetry as pastime. For us, it's all play, metaphors as numerous as cereal brands in a supermarket's fluorescent aisles. We're free to choose exactly what we say and when. Imagine a word, a world, where words are serious as bullets, where when you read your poems can determine if you'll ever read again. Would I put my life on the line? Am I brave enough to bleed for poetry? These are questions to be asked in the privacy of your own mind. Like the time I heard a woman scream down the hall from my apartment and had to decide if being courageous was as important as knowing I would be sitting there the next weekend on the sofa with my coffee and globe. Thank you. She takes the weight off of me Holding my hand She understands she leads me home from foreign lands She takes the wheel from my hand Holds me up when I no longer 
stand Brushes aside the endless demands She takes the weight off of me These endless pounds Wearing me down She knows the words Without a sound She has the feet on the ground A raft in these waves Without I drown Spring from where hope Can always be found She takes the weight off of me She understands Thank you. Peach and pear.